Glory. Well, we're in our last week in a sermon series on prayer, and I'm, I'm glad that we get to wrap it up with this. It's an interesting place to go today. And, and I come to you, you know, so my experience as a pastor a lot of times is that, that people kind of expect you to be the expert, right? It's, you know, if, if, you, if you go to whatever profession, you expect them to be the expert at it. If you go to a chiropractor, he better be an expert at being a chiropractor. Otherwise, you're going to walk out of there worse than you went in, right? Uh, so that's kind of, some of that comes with the territory. But, but as a pastor, I can't be the best at everything there is. There's, there's too much that falls under the umbrella of being a Christian for me to be like the shining pinnacle example of this. And I've been pretty transparent about this. I'm not the best prayer. I never have been. I'm certainly growing in my prayer life, and I've gotten better over the years. I used to be uh, just, just tremendously, pathetically bad at praying when I was a new Christian. Laughably bad, in fact. Uh, had you heard me pray in my early years of Christian life, you probably would have actually LOL'd, not just typed your LOL. You would have laughed. And uh, it, it was that bad. So I come as a, an imperfect uh, struggler in prayer. And and, 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 and sometimes maybe I have more head knowledge and I have more books maybe about prayer than you do, but that doesn't mean I necessarily have it all figured out. And, and, and I think that's a good thing, though, because that means I'm still growing and I'm still developing and getting better at this. But, but as I think about prayer and why we don't pray, a lot of times it's because we don't feel like we know enough, right? We don't feel like we're good enough. We don't feel like, like oh, is God really going to listen to to my prayers and 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 so sometimes it's just a matter of a lack of understanding on our part that keeps us from actually praying and, and while i'm not a good prayer i, I do still pray and and, and 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 certainly i'm encouraged by the fact that i don't have to be the best of prayers i don't have to have the best skills to do it it's a conversation with God. It's a chance for us to, to communicate and connect with, with our Creator God. And so um, we'll just hopefully give you a little encouragement here today to start, if you haven't been regularly praying, just to pray and have a conversation with God. You don't have to have fancy words. You don't have to have everything right. You don't have to have any of that kind of stuff. Just talk with God. And He will listen and He will respond to you. And so would encourage you to get that started off today just with that little bit of, of, of a pick-me-up. Of You don't have to have it all figured out. But, but first of all, as we're starting today, just by a quick show of hands, how many of you always know the right thing to do? Raise your hand. Right? You know the right thing to do. You, you, you don't? Now, now this is not the appropriate time to elbow your spouse. That's inappropriate in church. Some of you kind of can be know-it-alls occasionally, but, but whether it's, should I invest money here? Should I take this job? Whether it's, how do I raise my kids? Or what school should I go to? Or, or one of my least favorite questions, is this safe to eat, right? You got a spouse that's like, smell this. No, I don't want to smell this. What do you, if it smells bad to you, it's going to smell bad, don't. You know, right? Uh, we have those questions in life. And, and we don't always know what's best, do we? And, and truth be known, we want to know what's best, right? I mean, I, I, I subscribe to consumer reports because I don't want to buy junk, right? And, and I pour over consumer reports to figure out what the best nail polish is, even though I will never in my life probably be buying nail polish, right? But I will read that article so that I'm informed as to what has the best gloss in 2020. Um, but, but I want to know, right? I want to know what's best. I, I want to know what is best for me, what is best for my life, what is best for my family and for my church. I want to know what's best. And today that's kind of the essence of the prayer that the Apostle Paul delivers to the Philippians church. If you've got a Bible, feel free to follow along. We're going to be in the book of Philippians. So we're going to be in Philippians 1. Uh, verses 9 and 10. If you don't know where Philippians is, you know, you've got the New Testament, it's the back of your Bible. And then the way I've, I've mentioned this before is, is uh, um, as far as memorizing um, your, your books, there's, there's all sorts of little mnemonics, I think that's the right word, of, of trying to um, remember the order of things. And so for me, it's General Electric Power Company, right? Galatians, Ephesians, General Electric, Philippians, Power, C, Colossians. That's the only way I literally can remember. I learned that somewhere a long time ago. So General Electric Power Company, Galatians. So if you find one of those four books, you can, 
If you can remember that, find the other books. But we're going to be in Philippians uh, 1, 9 through 10. And if you don't have a Bible, there's some in the chairs. You are welcome to use electronic devices. U version is a great electric version of the Bible. And let me, as you're finding that, give you a little context, a little background. Uh, of course, the Apostle Paul is a big deal, right? He wrote like a third of the New Testament. And, and he's writing this letter now to the church at Philippi. Uh, literally from a, a Roman jail. And, and he doesn't know as he's sitting there in this jail exactly what life has in store for him. He's in jail, he's in chains, and he may be heading off to execution. He doesn't know quite yet. So these could be some of the, the last days that he has here on earth. And, and we know that he dearly loves the Philippian church. In fact, just a couple of verses before the verses we're looking at today, uh, he says this. He says, you know what? He says, every time I think of you, I thank God. Every single time I think of you, I thank God, Paul says. And, and now imagine your life and imagine your relationships. Imagine maybe there's somebody in your life that every single time you think of them, you give thanks and praise to God for their existence, right? If you did that, and I, I suspect most of us don't, do that on a regular basis. I mean, yes, I, I love my wife and son, but each and every time I think of him, I don't go, oh, thank you, God, for my wife, even though she's pretty awesome. But I still, uh, I just don't do that. But Paul says, every time I think of you folks, I praise God, I give thanks to God, right? And, and so you know, you know he loves them, right? He's got a, a passion for them. He cares for them deeply, he's saying. And so that's kind of the context of this letter that he writes to the church at Philippi, that, that he loves them. And, and he's writing to them because he doesn't know if he's ever going to get to see them again, right? Like, he's been there. He's been in some of their houses, probably. He's, he's ministered to them directly. He's made relationships with them, but he's like... Guys, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it back. I mean, I want to come see you, but, eh, you know, I'm kind of chained to this wall here a little bit, and it's not that I can really come right now. And I don't know if they're ever going to spring me. I, I may be here for the rest of my life. He doesn't know. And so, so he writes to them because he knows he can't go to them. And you can imagine that then whatever you would write and whatever you would be praying for those people would be prayers and, and things of great importance, Right? And it's within that, that context then that, that we read this from God's Word in Philippians 1, 9, and 10. And it says, it says this in your Bibles. It says, And this is my prayer, Paul writes, that your love may abound more and more, and that the knowledge and discernment, so that you will be able to discern what is best, so to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Now something that's really interesting as we break down this prayer of Paul's and we look at it, we see that Paul's saying is, He's kind of saying, okay, I, I pray that your love would abound more and more, right? And, and the first thing that, that comes to mind when I, when I read this from Paul is, is, is like, what kind, of, what kind of love are you talking about here, Paul? Because in the Greek, of course, many of you know, there's, there's numerous words for love. You've got phileo and agape and some other words. And, and it's like, which, which one of these are you talking about? What kind of love are you talking about? And we talked about this on Wednesday night, actually, with our students about how we use the word love, right? And in our, in our culture, in our society, we, we use the word love in, in interesting ways sometimes, and not always in the most clear and best ways, because, you know, like, I love my mom, and I love my, my, my wife, and you love your spouse or whatever, and, 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 and some of us will go, yeah, and, and, I, and I love the vice. Vikings, and I love Krispy Kreme donuts, which is holy, and that's a good thing, right? And, uh, yeah, anybody else? Krispy Kreme? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, they are good. But uh, we, we use this word love, but what kind of usage is Paul using the word love here? What kind of love is, is Paul talking about? And the type of love that Paul is talking about here is that agape kind of love. This kind of love that's, that's an unconditional love. The kind of love that comes from the, the very heart of God. It's that kind of, the kind of love that doesn't, that doesn't give up, that never quits. And it, it's that also that kind of love that doesn't just give us what we want, but it gives us what we do truly need. Sometimes that's the most loving thing, right? We know that as parents. Sometimes we don't give our kids what they want. Because we know that's not actually the best, but we do give them what they need. It's an unconditional love from our Father God, from the, the heart of God to us. And Paul says, 
I want this love, this, this kind of love. I want it to abound more and more, both in knowledge as well as in depth of insight. And, and, and the phrasing that Paul uses here is, uh, his ide- ideology here is that, okay guys, you're, you're going to experience love. And as you experience this, this love, this deep, rich, abiding love of God, uh, it's going to transform you, and it's going to transform you from the inside out, and you're going to experience something that's so deep within you, so deep inside of you, that as you experience this agape love, this amazing love, it's going to begin to change the way that you act, and the, the way that you think, and, 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 and it's going to transform who you are. And, and again, uh, the closest thing I can relate to this is, is being a parent, right? And, and, and conceptually, as a father, when my wife was pregnant, I, I already began to love my child, right? But it's not the same as what the mom is experiencing. The mom's loving this kid because she's carrying him everywhere, right? But then when that little guy comes out, or a little girl, in our case, a little guy, uh, you're just like, oh. There's like another level you move to as a dad. Like, ooh, I got to... This is my cub. I got to protect this. I got to provide for this. I, I really love this little guy, you know. And it like takes you to that next level, and and it kind of transforms you, especially as a first time dad. It's like, oof, we're moving to the next level of love here, right? And 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 now Paul's talking about this 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 deep, rich, abiding love, and it's this love that's abounding more. And now that you have knowledge, you you, you love even more, and and it transforms the way that we think and the way that we act and the things that we do. And that's what agape love does. And that's the, the type of love that, that Paul is talking about. Now, now, Paul is talking about agape love. And, and it's a little bit different than even I just described as a parent. Because, yes, I want to have unconditional love. I want to be fully loving and fully giving and, and, and whatever. But we're not perfect. We're all sinners. And, and, and we don't love perfectly, even as parents. We don't love our kids perfectly, even though we want to. We don't quite reach that level. So, so God gets it to a, to a whole other level when we're talking about this unconditionality of, of God's love for us. And, and Paul's saying, I want you to have that in abounding amounts, abounding more, just this amazing love. And he expresses this to us in, in so many different ways so that, that as followers of Christ, so that we can grow and know and share and as God pours that abundance into us, it's so that we'll have an excess that we can funnel into others. And so, so Paul is praying this for this church, that they would have this amazing level of experience of, of the love of God, and then that God could then utilize them to, to speak in love and truth and, and share that love with those people around them. And that's what God does to us, right? God brings us into a relationship with Jesus Christ, not so that then we huddle around the campfire of Jesus and, and warm ourselves and, okay, that, that's all I need, right? No. And so we go and bring others to the, to the heat, to the light, and bring them in and say, hey, I found something warm. Come over here and warm up with me, right? And, and that's what Paul is encouraging them here. And, and, and maybe you've had somebody, you know, kind of like that in your life. I, I certainly have been blessed with that. Uh, for me, uh, one of the people who, who, who did that in my life is a guy by the name of Ryan. Now, Ryan, I, I've briefly touched on here, and there he was the best man at my wedding. Um, he was one of the guys who was very instrumental in my becoming a Christian. But once I became a Christian, he kind of took it to the next level. You know, he, 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 he made sure that I had what I needed to continue on this, this faith journey along this path. And, and he didn't just stop kind of once he got me over that threshold, once I, once I made a commitment to Christ, he didn't just say, okay, you're on the team. Now I'm off. No. He came alongside of me and, and he spoke truth to me, which I needed back then because I was still, I mean, I, I had started following Jesus, but I hadn't figured all the following Jesus out, right? And so there was a lot of stuff I still had to kind of kind of iron out and figure out and clean up in my life and straighten out. And, you know, just, I, you know, some people are like, Bam. And then, you know, they were transformed and everything was changed. I was like, okay, I love Jesus. Now it's going to take a while for me to grow in that. And, and thankfully, I had a guy like him to come along and mentor me. And he helped me to, to become a better follower of Jesus. And, and honestly, to become a better me. Um, he, he loved me through my life's ups and downs in those days. He kept me accountable 
for many, many years as I was a new Christian. And, and I'm here today, decades and decades later, still going strong because of what a, a fellow follower of Christ did in showing me unconditional love. Um, he, he was exceptional at constantly pointing me towards God and then generally modeling that in his life. And if you're taking notes, just, just write this down as your first note. This is the first one there on your notes. It says, the key to knowing what is best is knowing God. The key to knowing what is best is knowing God. Uh, it's simple but complicated, right? And this is what Ryan really, really was exceptional for me, at, at pointing me towards God continually. Um, and ideally, this is why you are here today. Uh, the key to knowing what is best for us is, is knowing God. And that should be why you're here, right? But the truth is, sometimes we come to church because maybe somebody drug us here, right? Or, or maybe you come to church because you're just here out of obligation. It was your week to serve and you're just like, well, I, I guess I'm on the list. It's my turn. I, I better show up, right? And sometimes we come to church because we're drug here. We're, we're here out of duty. We're here out of obligation. But but, uh, or maybe your parents just simply said, you got to go, right? That, that happens. I was that kid for a lot of years where my, uh, my parents just said, no, you'll be there. And so I was. And, and, and that's really what all of this, what we do here is actually about. The reason we are here is so that we can get to know God better. That's really everything that we do fundamentally is, is about that very thing. Every song we sing, every prayer we pray, Every, every time we serve somebody, every time we love somebody, every time we give or we receive, every time we open the Bible and hear God's Word, it's so that we can get to know God better. And, and the key to knowing what is best for our lives is found in knowing God. We all want clarity for our lives. We all want God to speak very directly into our lives and tell us, do this and don't do that, right? Um, yet, Continually, we, we kind of try to shortcut the process, don't we? If we really want to know what's best for our lives, that comes from regular and intimate time with God. It comes from connecting with God. It comes from being with God and being with God's people. And that brings us to the very first sermon note, if you're one of those people who likes to fill in every line. Um, one of the best ways that we can learn what is best for us is by seeking godly counsel. This again is my buddy Ryan was is still to this day, and, and Ryan lives in South Dakota in Sioux Falls, and I haven't seen him for quite some time. But I know at any time I could call this guy, and, and he will give me godly counsel. He will give me wisdom. He 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 will answer my questions truthfully, even when sometimes I don't want to hear those truths. We have to have people in our lives like that. And, and another time where I had the great experience with this was when I, when I first began to listen to God's call on my life to go into full-time vocational ministry, uh, to become a pastor, right? Um, back then, well, still today at times, I had a lot of doubts, frankly. Am I called to be a pastor, right? Is that really what God wants me to do? Because you see, I'd had a pretty sketchy background, right? I hadn't memorized the whole Bible. Uh, I wasn't good at prayer. Uh, I hadn't led anything bigger than a couple of small groups in a high school ministry in my church at the time. There was a lot of things in my mind that seemed like they might keep me from even getting into seminary, let alone succeeding through seminary, right? Let alone graduating and then becoming a pastor. So... I'd asked my pastor, he's a friend of mine still to this day, his name is John Tolley, he pastors one of our sister churches in the cities. I said, John, uh, can I meet with you? Oh yeah, yeah, what do you need? Well, John, I just, I, this is what I think God's doing in my life. I think, I think God might be calling me to go into ministry, but that sounds really crazy to me. What do you think? And so he sat down, we had lunch, uh, sat down, actually had Mexican, and um, talked about it and then thought about it and prayed about it and he, 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 he gave me some insight into me of things that he'd been observing for the last few years and, and, uh, and kind of helped me discern whether this was God's calling on my life or not 
or whether it was just that, that extra spicy burrito I had had with John, and that was what was actually burning in my gut instead of God, right? And so, so John really helped me discern what, what was going on. And, and I didn't stop just at John. I asked some of the deacons in my church. They were men in my men's group. So I said, I said guys, this is, God's kind of putting this in my heart. It sounds kind of crazy to me, but what do you think? And so they prayed, and they talked with me, and, 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 and again, they kind of affirmed for me what God was saying. They said, yeah, we, we see this in you. We think you should go and do this. And, and while that really scared me a lot, frankly, the godly counsel that I was given by, by these, these men in my life brought great clarity in knowing what was best for my life. See, we all want to know what's best for our lives, and in order to do that, we need to seek godly counsel from those around us and see if God doesn't then speak through them and give us wisdom from, from the leaders and other people that God has placed into our lives that, that have, we've had influence from. Godly leaders that we trust. That's one of the first steps for us of knowing what's best for our lives. And then as you begin to maybe see a consensus as people begin to affirm in you or give you an answer of, of, of whether or not you should proceed with whatever that might be. Um, kind of the next step in that process is after we seek this godly counsel, the second thing that we do is I needed to pray, right? And that's the second one on your list. I, I began to listen to God in my prayers. Funny thing about prayer is that a lot of times, and I know this is true for me at least, a lot of times we're talking to God, right? Uh, we pray, here's my list, right? Here, here's the things. Here's, we, we, we grab out the bulletins, we pray down that list, all right, on to the next thing. But prayer is communication. And, and, and communication is more than just, here's my list, God, amen. And you close the book and you're done. It, it needs to be something, something greater than that. I mean, guys, think of this. If you were to come home one night after work and, and your wife was like, well, how's your day? And then as a man, we had like 12 words answered and then we were out of words for the day, right? Like, it was good. Bob fell off the tractor. We laughed. Lunch was great. End of the day. I mean, that's kind of like our man answer. And then, then imagine you said to your wife, well, honey, how was your day? And she started to answer, and then you just walked out of the room. <laughs> right? How would that go for you? Anybody going to survive that evening? Right? Hopefully she wasn't in the kitchen with the knives. But uh, you, you wouldn't do that to your wife. Yet, we, dear God, here's my list of things. Okay, amen. And we walk off. Right? Don't we? Anybody else do that? I do. I give God my list and then I don't listen. I, I, I don't pause. I don't wait. I, I, it's not communication. It's just me machine gunning a few thoughts to Jesus and closing the door. Right? And part of prayer is that we need to listen, not just talk. So, back to my story as I was discerning whether or not I should go to seminary, I, I began to pray. And as I began to pray, and I was praying some before, but now, now that I had this affirmation, I was really praying. Now, now some people were saying, yeah, we think you should go to seminary. I was like, oh, now I really need to pray, right? And, and so I, I began to pray more. And sometimes you, you'll hear people say things like, well, God spoke to me, right? And, and when, when I say that, or if I ever use that term, I, this is what I mean. I don't, I don't mean like, like God's voice with Morgan Freeman said, Chris, you should go to seminary. That, I, I didn't have that experience. Well, what I did experience, though, through prayer was really some, some strong internal promptings and, and some confirmations of things. I was praying, um, God, I, I don't know, I don't know if I can do this. And here's all my problems, and here's all my concerns, and here's all the reasons why I can't do this, God. And, and one by one, as I was praying for him, God began just, just cutting them off. Well, God, I don't have a place to live. Bam, I get a phone call. From, from a lady who's director of housing at Bethel and says, hey, I've got one apartment and it's yours if you want it. And I said, well, um, I, I can't move there for six months. I'm already in a contract and I can't move. She's like, that's fine. I'll leave it open until you move here. For six months? You'll have an open apartment just waiting for me? Like, God, are you trying to speak to me? Right? I had to listen. And God answered my prayers. And, 
And as I was praying, these answers started coming. And, and sometimes they're, they're almost so loud, you, you can't ignore them. This compelling thing was building inside of me as I was praying to God. That, wow, I actually got to go do this. And so it was at that point as I began to pray and um, that I was really, really now like, I guess... I think I'm doing this, you know. It sounded crazy to me, but I guess, okay, God, you're leading me to quit my job and, and go to seminary. Many of you have probably felt this before, you know, as you pray, as God begins to, to burden you, as you try to discern what's best for your life. And, and as, we, as we listen to Paul, we hear this in his prayer. And he says, I'm praying for you, the Philippian church, but also for us. That, that, that he wants this love of God to abound in us more and more. And, and then that's going to happen as we seek godly counsel. And then as we go to God in prayer and we begin to actually listen uh, to what he is speaking to us about. And then the third way that God kind of comes to us and speaks to us within that is by spending some time in God's word. That's where we can probably get our, our final portion of confirmation. And of course, these can all be done in whatever order. But, but this was kind of the third step for me as I was uh, going down this path of, of, of adventuring into going into seminary. First, I listened to some, some people I trusted. Second, I, I prayed to God. And third, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people. I'm not a big leap of faith kind of person, right? I, I was that kid... Who, who, who would go to the end of the diving board and have to stand there for a second the first time every year before I could jump off. And eventually I would jump. But, but some kids, my younger brother is one of those kids, yeah, I mean, he, he started running before he got to the ladder. He reached full speed at the top of the ladder, and he didn't slow down as he ran off the end of the diving board, right? That, that's my brother. That's the way he does life. Me, it was, you know, I got to get there. I got to look. All right. I guess we're doing this. Okay. And then I could do it. And it was kind of like that with this too. And so I was still seeking kind of that, that, that final, final affirmation. So I was digging into God's Word and, and then trying to figure out if this is really what God had in store for me. And it was kind of hoping to look. And, you know, sometimes, I don't know if you've ever done this. It's like, God, I need an answer. Um, for I receive from the Lord who I also pass on to you that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed. What? You know, that doesn't answer my questions. That's communion. Um, that actually is what it opened to, by the way. But uh, some of us try that. And sometimes that does work and God will speak to you in that way. But, but for me, it wasn't so much that. It was a broader story that, that God had brought me to um, to speak in this season of discerning, to speak to my heart, to show me uh, as I was seeking what was best for my life. And then and, and God directed me through a, a particular passage that comes out of Numbers 11. And, and um, you're certainly welcome to turn there. I'm going to summarize a bunch of it so you don't necessarily need to. But if you don't remember back in Numbers 11, the situation was that, that uh, Moses had actually led the Israelites out of bondage, out of slavery in Egypt, of course. And... and uh, God sends Moses to Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let us go. Oh, no, no, no. Well, if you don't, bad things are going to happen. No, no, no. Okay, so bad things happen. God sent plagues and pestilence, plague after plague after plague. Finally, Pharaoh's like, all right, go, 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 go. So he says, I don't want you here anymore. Leave, get out of here. Of course, the Israelites leave. God parts the Red Sea. They go out in the desert. Now God is supernaturally at this point providing for the Israelites in, in amazing ways through something called manna, right? Like, like every day. Uh, they'd get up in the morning and the dew would fall and they'd go out and they'd kind of have to collect up and scrape up this manna stuff and then they'd go and mix it up and make kind of a, 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 some sort of bread. And every day they would wake up and God had provided. Every day there was food there, something for them to eat. I mean, they're out in a desert, not a lot to eat. There's million plus people there. So it's going to take a lot of food to feed all these people. So God had provided them in, in, in ways that only God could, just in an amazing, amazing way. Not only had he done that, he delivered them from slavery, protected them from, from battles, from all kinds of stuff. But at this point in the story, in Numbers 11, um, we find the Israelites, as they're so frequently doing, whining and complaining, right? And a whinging and moaning. And they're like... Ah, manna again, right? They're upset. They've been eating manna three squares a day, every day, that's all they had. Manna, manna, manna. I'm tired of manna. 
And, and, and they're grumbling, they're complaining to Moses. And in verse 5, they say, they say, we remember the fish, right? So back when we were slaves, occasionally we would get fish. And they're like, huh, kind of liked slavery because I got fish, right? That's backward it says that sounds. That's kind of what they were saying. You know what? We got fish and it didn't cost us anything. We got three fish back in Egypt. Remember the fish. And I read that story and I'm like, have they lost their minds? Right? Of course, I come from a 20th century perspective. But they're like, we missed the fish. And then they're like, oh yeah, and we had cucumbers back then. And they were good. We liked cucumbers. What about the, the melons that we used to have? Huh, Moses? We used to have leeks. We used to have onions and garlic and other things, right? Oh, that was good. It was good. Life was good. I wish we could go back. I mean, that's what they're saying to Moses, right? After God has done these amazing, miraculous things every single day. But they're like, we've lost our appetite for the amazingness of God. We, we've, nah, he performs that miracle every day. It's getting old. We're tired of it, right? All we, all we ever see, Moses, is this manna. And we read that and we go, how ridiculous. Truth of the matter is we are kind of like the Israelites. God does miraculous things in our lives every day and we're like, Man, that again? Another sunrise God? <sighs> Whatever. Right? And we're all kind of like a despondent teenager uh, re- reacting to our parents going, eh, whatever, Dad. Eh. And that's what the Israelites were doing. And Moses is like, you've been delivered from bondage, from slavery, and you're worried about garlic, onions, and cucumbers, and fish? You guys have lost your minds. But, but we do that very same thing. And, and so we come to God and we're just whining, we're complaining. I don't know about you, but I've certainly, certainly done that. Certainly, certainly been an Israelite myself. Now Moses hears this and he's upset, right? Understandably so. Moses gets a little fired up at this point in the, in the Bible. And, and not only is Moses a little angry at the Israelites, he's also actually a little angry at God at this time too. And so, so he starts up a conversation with God. And Moses says to God, he says, God, did I conceive these people? Did I give birth to them? Why did you tell me to, to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land that you promised and that you said you would give to our ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people, Lord? Where can I get meat for all of them? I, I, I can't carry all these people by myself. The, the burden's too great, God. It's too heavy for me. And then and Moses, it just kind of almost cracks me up. Moses says to God, he says, if you're going to treat me this way, Lord, why don't you just please go ahead and kill me? That's what Moses says to God, right? That's what he says. Now, maybe you're like, what are you doing here, Moses, Right? And it sounds like Moses is complaining to God, and he certainly is. And he's arguing with God, in fact. And he's telling God all of this stuff. But here's the thing. Moses is doing this in prayer. That's how he's communicating with God. He's praying to God. He's pouring his heart out to God. Even even though it sounds almost painfully childish to us, he's being honest with God. And as we read this passage in Numbers 11, I don't think a lot of us will ever think of that as a prayer normally. Because how many of your prayers look like that, where you, where you tell God the true stuff, right? A lot of times we want to just share with God the good things, we kind of shine it up, we polish it, maybe a couple of our concerns, but we really don't dig in deep with God and get to the, the root and the gunk and the mess of our lives. And Moses here is being real. He's like, I'm tired of these people and their whining and their complaining. I'm tired of them complaining about fish and cucumbers. God, where am I going to get meat for all of these people? I don't understand, God. Why would you leave me here? God, if if this is what you had intended for me, God, just kill me now. That's what Moses says. I don't want to deal with these people anymore. Just take me, Lord. I'm done with them. And he's being honest. He's being real. And many times we would benefit ourselves from being honest and real with God like this. God already knows, but he wants us to come to him and be honest. And so he, Moses says, I'm tired of these people. I'm getting frustrated. And, and I think we can find in this encouragement that we need to be real with God in our prayers. 
Because God is big enough to deal with our problems. We just a lot of times are unwilling to share them with Him. Even your whining, even your complaining, God says, bring it to me. So I would encourage you today, express yourself in prayer to God. And and then check it out. Moses listens to God. And this is an interesting, I'm going to close with this part of the story because it's very interesting. Moses, God says, I want you to get 70 people. Go get 70 elders of Israel. Go bring them up here, and I'm going to give them a little bit of the power that I've given to you. Uh, I'm going to help distribute a bit of the leadership here so that your burden's a little bit lighter. And so so he seeks out God, and and God uh, gathers up some godly people around Moses and that, that are going to help Moses through this process. And he says, you'll, you'll share with them a little bit of this power. And, 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 and what I'm going to do, Moses, is I'm going to give them some meat. Okay? Now, you might think, okay, God's going to, you know, he's going to send a couple of Whoppers or something, right? Uh, a couple of cheesesteaks or, you know, maybe some hamburger or something. Something. But just, just to kind of shut them up. But, but our God is a God of abundance, right? And I think our God also has a sense of humor. So God doesn't just send them meat for a day. God doesn't just send them meat for a week. He sends them enough meat for a whole month, right? And God says, I'm going to send them so much meat, effectively, quail, that basically it's going to come squirting out of their nostrils, right? They, they've been complaining, they don't have meat, I'm going to make sure they have meat, and they know who provided it for them. Now, we're talking, you know, an upwards of a million people, an awful lot of meat. But God shows up in an amazing way and meets their needs. And, and, and God, just like that in our lives, can, can kind of throw this God bomb into the midst of our, of our complaining, in the midst of our worry, in the midst of our doubts. I remember, th- I remember thinking, can I be a pastor? Do I want to leave this really good life that I've established? See, I had a great job. I had just best the year I quit ministry, or the year I quit and went in the ministry or went to seminary. I'd had just the very best year of my entire career that year before. I'd led one of the top five people in the nation in, in the job that I was doing. I had a fabulous year. Everything was going great. I was getting pay raises. I was getting responsibility. I loved the church I was in. I liked the town that I lived in. I had a roommate who split my rent, so life was great. He was a good friend. I mean, it was like everything was kind of clicking all cylinders and. And then I had these doubts about whether I could be a pastor. And it's like, oh, is this really what you're calling me to, God? I'm feeling this calling, but it doesn't make sense. And God says the same thing to me that day, or those days, as he says to Moses out in the desert. When, when Moses is questioning God, God says to Moses, he says, Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? Like, Like, is his arm so short that he can't accomplish this? Is he unable to do this? Chris, I know you have some worries. I know you've got a lot going on. But is my arm too short? Am I unable to make this calling on your life happen? And it was at that point, it was like, just boom. I knew, absolutely. I I, I gave up fighting God. and was like, all right, I'm sending my application into Bethel Seminary. Right? So I, I sent off my application. A few weeks later, I was accepted. It was like, bam, bam. God had kicked down the doors and, and, and taken away all the things that I should have feared and had doubts from. He just, just one by one, started taking those away from me. Whether it was, how would I pay for it? Where would I live? Where would I work? I, didn't, I knew one person out of three million in the Twin Cities. But here's the thing. I was asking all of the wrong questions because all of those questions, they weren't the ones that really mattered. The question I should have been asking God was, what is best for my life? What is best for my life was following this pursuit that he'd placed in my heart, going, doing this thing that he was calling me to. It wasn't about all those things that I was worried about. And in that process, God transformed me, and his love abounded more and more. And through that, I got to know him more through through godly counsel, through prayer, and through time in his word. So God showed up in amazing and abundant ways, and He can do that for you today as well. I'm nothing special in that regard. But God says to us, if we're willing to lean into Him on this, I've got this. And so as I did then, I leaned in Him and trusted Him and would challenge you to do the same. 
the key to knowing what is best for our lives is knowing God. And how do we know God? Through godly counsel, through prayer, and through reading the Word of God. Now there's other ways too, but those are the primary ones. Do those things and see if God doesn't show up and just blow you away with His answers. God is good. Trust Him in this. Let's pray.